Yes, yes, yes. Welcome back to another episode of Act Root to Fruit. My name is Marcel, and uh, I'm on a quest to excavate the roots of the contextual behavioral sciences so that uh, us clinicians can deliver the most pristine fruit to our clients in the world. Today, I have the great privilege of being uh, bringing you... Uh, primatologist Franz de Waal, who's been studying and observing uh, in a non-invasive way primate behavior for 40 years. He's the director of the Living Link Center for the Advanced Study of Ape and Human Evolution, a distinguished professor at Utrecht University and a professor of primate behavior in the psychology department at Emory University, uh, also author of such books as Chimpanzee Politics, Power and Sex Amongst Apes, which I, I understand Newt Gingrich is a big fan of, and uh, also uh, Mama's Last Hug, amongst other other wonderful, wonderful books. Thank you, Franz, for joining me today. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, we're here to talk a little bit about evolution, and, and, and that's why my our buddy here, uh, Charles Darwin, is, is joining us. I'm, I'm curious about... Um, something you know within within the act community something that gets talked about a lot is this this evolutionary question of get lunch or be lunch okay and and how that is kind of that that's kind of our in our programming of how we how how we navigate the world and so i'm wondering if 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 you think that's that's enough for clinicians to know about evolution <laughs> that seems like a simplification get lunch or be lunch uh yeah Meaning, meaning, what does it mean? Is that we are, we are. So, so that, so that we are, we are always on alert for, for threats. Yeah, that's and probably true. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and so and and that that goes back to you know our, our pre-verbal days, and uh, and far far beyond that, and uh, and so <clears throat> we're we're constantly trying to diminish uh, discomfort. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's why negative negative things that we see are uh, are much more important. They weigh heavier, have more value than the positives. You know where yeah. the where the yeah. It's funny that uh, that you think that way because there is of course a, a stream of anthropology and philosophy and so on who think that humans have always been superior to everything else and that we rule the savanna, we, we 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 rule the world and we rule the world now. Uh, but I think when we left the forest, when our ancestors left the forest, which is like maybe maybe six million years ago or five million years ago, um, uh, we left also the security of the forest, and we were small. Our ancestors were small, smaller yeah. than we are now. Yeah. And and the savanna was populated by big animals, bigger than they are now. So the hyenas were three times the size of that they are now. The lions were bigger, and so. Um, they must have been scared to death uh, when they when they entered the savanna, and it must have been a very difficult moment because they were prey. They 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 were not ruling the savanna like like the, the narrative that we like to have about ourselves. Yeah. So yes, we I think we were um, very much under predation, and so uh, that whole thing of be lunch is is probably true. Yeah. 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 And and interesting something you said there as far as uh, us, this this us as seeing ourselves as so important. I mm -hmm. think that when I really grasped that, that we aren't any more important than any other species, I, I really struggled with that. Yeah, because you want to be the center of the universe. Yeah, or... of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, if, if let's say if, if a virus like COVID wipes us all out, uh, the world will, uh, will keep existing, you know? Yeah. Uh, the, um, we are not central to, to, the, to the planet as it is. We're not central to the universe. So yeah, that's that's an idea. I don't know where that comes from, but um, that's a very self-obsessed idea: is that we okay. are more important than other life forms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and so back to my my question. Part part of what I'm asking too is is, you know, there's a few different um, parts to evolutionary theory. One is that we've evolved from the species, and then also the processes that that we go about natural selection and variation. That that some people 
are, are able to more easily digest than the first part. Do, mm-hmm. do you think that that's okay, that, that we buy one part but not the other, that some people do? You mean that some people believe in natural selection, but they don't believe that we descend from other primates? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, that's the problem is that, uh, with the religious view of evolution, is that, uh, in the West at least, is that um, people are willing to accept evolution for everything else, like butterflies and flowers and giraffes and so on, but when it comes to the human species, all of a sudden they get blocked and um, we need to be special and we need to be sort of separate, separate creation almost. Um, and um, humans are excluded from the process. And the human body is still included. So my hands and my feet and my genitals and my heart, all of that, we can understand that that evolved from other species and so lo- looks similar to other species. But the human mind, that's where we draw the line. The yeah. human mind needs to be separate. So, uh, yeah, I always say that's sort of ev- evolution from the neck down, so to speak. Yeah. Ah. And, and everything above that is different. And what's the harm in that? The harm of thinking that way? Yeah. Well, it has given us a lot of trouble, I think. I, I consider it as a failure of Western philosophy. Uh, Western philosophy has always traditionally emphasized the differences, like what makes humans special, what makes us unique and emphasized all these differences instead of emphasizing the similarities, which are much more numerous, but uh, always the differences. Uh, That has put us apart from nature, that has put us above nature and separate from nature. And at the moment with the the big crisis in the world, the climate change crisis, the Mm -hmm. virus crisis, we are seeing that an attitude where we place ourselves outside of nature is actually very detrimental for us because it gives us the attitude that we can do whatever we want with nature. We can eat bats, it's going to be fine. We can destroy the oceans, it's going to be fine. We have that attitude that we can do whatever we want Mm -hmm. because we are separate from nature. And I think we're learning the hard way at this very moment that we're not separate from nature. So, So that whole philosophy of emphasizing the distinctness of the human species, the human exceptionalism, has been a disaster, I think. Mm. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. And, um, and so you've, you've, I've heard you say that, that you're very grateful to work with a species that doesn't have language (laughs) and, uh, and you know, us as most, you know, this is a a show geared towards clinicians and we're, we're trying to help, help folks who maybe have a little bit too much language going on. What, what do we have to learn from, from your observational work? Yeah. The reason I say that I prefer to work with the, the animals who it's because in in psychology, I'm a biologist, but I have taught for 25 years in psychology. Mm-hmm. And I know that in psychology, everyone is focused on questionnaire methods, so self-report methods. And I don't trust them at all. I, I don't trust what people tell, tell you about themselves. Uh, I'm willing to listen to it, and I think some of it uh, may be true. But if you get to sensitive topics like their relation with their parents or their sex life or even even what they eat or their ideology. As soon as you get to sensitive parts, um, people start um, presenting themselves in a different way than they really are. And so I think the questionnaire method is very questionable. Uh, and I would prefer that psychology returns to, uh, to behavior, returns mm. to watching people, observing them, see what they do. Um, let me tell you an interesting story on this. Mm. I had a colleague who... Um, in the primate center in Wisconsin, where you are. Uh, I had a colleague who studied uh, the food intake of uh, pregnant monkeys. And he noticed that a a pregnant rhesus monkey eats five times more than usual. Hmm. And so then he wanted to know if if the same is true for human women. Uh, And so he asked women uh, how much they were eating and what they were eating during their pregnancy. And he noticed that they didn't change. They didn't change their behavior. So he was very puzzled by that until one day he, he, he said, why don't you bring the grocery store receipts to me? Mm. And so he got the receipts from the grocery store and all of a sudden he noticed that they were eating very differently, mm-hmm. very different stuff that they didn't talk about. And that has always stuck with me as a story about you need to observe people, you need to get behavioral data somehow on them. It's got to be more reliable than asking people about things. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so how much of your work is, I mean, obviously a lot of what you're observing is the, the social behavior. Mm -hmm. What about just body language? Yeah, body language is very important, of course, yeah. in the primates. And so in my book, Mama's Last Hug, I talk about the facial expressions very much, which is, of course, also in humans how we often study the emotions. We Paul Ekman's work and so very important, of course, in the human studies. But the whole body is involved in the emotions. The emotions are always expressed in the body. The emotions are sort of live on the interface between mind and body. And if if you are very emotional and your body doesn't respond, let's say you told you tell me I was very emotional, but your body didn't do anything. There was no heart rate increase or temperature increase or voice changes. Uh, I, I have my doubts whether you were very emotional because emotions are always expressed one way or another in the body. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole body. It's not just a, a part of the body or the face only. So, for example, um, fear, one of the most studied emotions. Fear has been studied, of course, in rodents and in humans. Fear withdraws blood from the extremities because we, we need that blood for other actions. Mm -hmm. So fear prepares you for action, like fighting or fleeing. And uh, in rats, that means that the, the feet get cold, the tail gets cold. In humans, we say, I get cold feet, literally, because mm -hmm. uh, we, we withdraw blood. And, and so the, the body of the rat and the human have very similar responses to fear. And also, we know from the brain that the amygdala is involved in fear in humans and in rats. And so the, the bodily changes uh, are basically very similar. And, and that's also why... I think a term like fear should be used for both rats and humans uh, instead of trying to find something else for rats because that's what people have been doing is that they're trying to find a different word for, for what they do. Uh, I think all these things are totally related and uh, we need to have the same terminology for them. Okay. And, and, and body your ability to read body language in primates, is that, is that something that you developed over time or you were, you were taught? I was a student of a professor who was a specialist in f facial expressions. So he had studied facial expressions uh, all over the primate uh, order and compared them in great detail. And so I was, as a student, already very used to talking about facial expressions and emotions, even though in those days the emotions were a taboo topic for people who worked on animal behavior. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, 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 were, we were allowed to talk about uh, motivations and the functions of behavior but uh, things like emotions we had to keep out of there and I think part of the problem there was that people confused feelings and emotions so, so they will say such things you will never know what your dog feels which is true I will never know what a dog feels I, I have that same problem actually with other humans as well and I, I will never know what you feel you can describe your feelings to me but it's very hard for me to know what you're exactly feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, but with animals, for sure, the, the feeling part, which are private states and conscious states very often, um, are, are unknown to me. And so all I can do is measure in the body uh, how the emotions, uh, how they come up and how they, uh, how they interact with, with their behavior. And so um, I was very used to working on that. Uh, the facial expressions and the body language, we have ways in etology of, of describing them. So, for example, mm -hmm. facial expressions in the chimpanzee, I think there's probably 25 or so that we, that we have descriptions of and photos and drawings. And, and so then you say, this is the silent bared teeth face, which is very similar to the human smile, let's say. So, okay. so that's how we work with these things. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I wonder a lot about that because it's, it's such an important component of, of how we communicate and yet it's not in, in, in the field of psychology generally is not something that gets much attention. Yeah, that's unfortunate is because psychology has moved away from behavior. Mm -hmm. Psychology has moved to questionnaires and so the, instead of studying behavior, they, inst they study what people tell you about their behavior, which is really not the same thing yeah. for me. And yeah, so I think we should return to um, actually behavioral studies and, and the, the best psychologists in that regard are often the child psychologists, the developmental mm -hmm. psychologists. They yeah. work with pre-verbal creatures or yeah. at least um, they, children even under five or so, it's better to observe them, to, to talk with them, I think. And so the, the child psychologists have developed all these techniques which come out of etology, which is the study of animal behavior. And so for the 
biologists like myself, that's a group of psychologists can, I can talk with because they have similar similar techniques, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the extent of, of uh, attention this got in my graduate training was a professor once told me, listen with your eyes. Uh -huh. And that's... That's as much that's as much instruction as, as I got. Which I mean, it was it's a, it's a nice wise statement, but as far as how to do that and what you, what to look for. Yeah, I once heard from a, a family therapist because you are in family therapist or or, or um, a therapist. I, I work in I work in a community health clinic. Yeah, so yeah, kind of generalist. A family therapist once told me that um, if he was working with a, a man and a woman who were married, uh, he only needed to see. Uh, let's say the woman was in his office and, and the man would walk in, let's say. He only needed to see for less than a second the expression on the face of the woman when the man walks in to know what kind of relationship they have. Hmm. He, he said it can be a loving expression or she's happy to see him. It can be a hateful one or it can be a fearful one. Uh, and I, that always has stuck with me is that he didn't need a long discussion, he said, because he could see it right away. Mm -hmm. is, is that, you think that's true? Is that, is that true for you too? I think so. I think though it, it. I don't know if it always it always applies, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I mean, I have I have definitely uh, the the more uh, attention and the, the better I have been able to pick up on physical cues. The more I can really key into what's going on with somebody. Yeah, you know, I've, yeah. I've I've been able to to ask someone just hey what what I, I just seeing a shift in in their in their face a minor shift that I never I would never have seen before or noticed. Just acknowledging that and asking them about that. It's it opens up a nice window into to what's happening if they're willing to step in. Because we humans are very good at masking our emotions. And so what probably happens, what he probably meant to say also, is that after that first second, the woman masks the expressions and, and you don't see it anymore. It, it's just, mm. it's briefly there yeah. and you have to pick up on it. Uh, because we humans, we hide a lot of emotions, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's more and, so and, than, and, and, you know, I think, in other people. primates... In other primates, they are more on the surface, although they're also capable of hiding them. So they sometimes, uh, sometimes you misjudge their emotions because they, they fake them or they hide them. Yeah. Yeah. And what are what um, can you talk some more about the primates hiding emotions? Well, they do it sometimes for deceptive purposes. So, for example, you may have let's say an old female who tries to get hold of a younger female to punish her. Uh, but the younger female is too fast, and then the old female will act very friendly and, mm. and to get her close. And then when she's close, she attacks her nonetheless. So, so that's a deceptive use of um, emotional expressions. That kind of things uh, okay. between males it may happen also. Males, uh, an adult male may be very intimidated by another one and show a fearful facial expression, but then he puts a hand over it. Like we, we humans, we may put put a hand over our face when we don't want you to see that I'm mm -hmm. laughing or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that that's one that I think is so key that that should be incorporated more in, in the training of, of clinicians and therapists, psychologists is, is is this, you know, the covering of the mouth. You know, there's a powerlessness there too. Uh -huh. you know? And well, uh, that is because you have more control over your hand than over your face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our faces are not under full control. Yeah. And and what about what about sex differences in primates in mm -hmm. terms of emotions, hiding emotions, expressing emotions? Yeah, you know, in the uh, in, in humans, of course, people often say that women are more emotional than men. I, mm -hmm. I don't believe a word of that. Uh, I think men are just as emotional as women, but uh, under different circumstances. So, so for example, you look at men who watch a sports game, you will see an enormous range of very strong <laughs> emotions. So it's not that men are not emotional, but it's for different reasons sometimes yeah. Yeah. than when women, and 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 the rules of expression are sometimes also different. Yeah. So so. A man is not allowed to cry under many no. circumstances, and yeah. so uh, they may want to cry, but they're not going to show that. So, so the rules of expression are also different. So that's where I see the the, the gender differences, not so much in emotionality in general. Uh, I don't believe in that so much. And in primates, Any? in the primates, we have the same thing: is that uh, the males, for example, they will hide emotions, especially in competitive contexts. Okay. And so, for example, um, hiding vulnerabilities is very typical of males because um, being vulnerable is not a good thing if you're in a competitive context. And, and so, could you uh, paint a picture of what, how, what it looks like for a primate to be vulnerable? Uh, 
Well, did, I mean that very literally. So you may have, for example, a male who is injured. Okay. He's limping. But as soon as he sees another male on the horizon, he will walk normally. Uh, he's normally limping and, and licking his injuries, but now he is uh, he's not showing that. So so he hides his, his vulnerabilities because uh, in the confrontations between males, it's not a good thing to look like you're limping. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. So yeah, so, take it. I, I mean it very literally here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this isn't this 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 isn't something new that us us men are dealing with. No, sometimes I I I sometimes see that we should teach boys to be more vulnerable and show their vulnerability. Uh, I think that's uh, that's silly because boys live in a different world where mm. indeed being uh, vulnerable is not always a good thing to show. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So maybe maybe. Maybe there's a, a nuanced approach to that because I, yeah. I think I think part of the, the what gets beaten out of us is that we can't have emotions. We we can have anger as men, and we can have maybe some joy sometimes, you know. <laughs> but we can't really demonstrate much else. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's very strange. There's of course also cultural differences yeah. there. Yes. Is that um, when I came to the U.S. for me that was a bit of a surprise. Is that uh, men are, men are supposed to love sports? which I don't love at all. Yeah. Uh, and men are supposed to be very tough, more than in my culture in the Netherlands. Men, men are tougher than women, but we don't need to be always tough. So I think in the U.S. there is more emphasis on that than in, in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, uh, it's an inter interesting culture, interesting <laughs> country you, you immigrated to, I have to yeah. say. Um, and so, so we're talking about um, body language and observing. I know that I know that there's been some. I, I've heard you. I think in your book, "Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are?" You talk about some um, uh, conflict between the the study of of animals and behaviorism. Mm -hmm. And, and there, they, there's a, there's a rough history there. Yeah. And where is that now? Is that, is there any reconciliation? I think behaviorism is sort of interesting because the central idea of conditioning and, and reward and punishment, you know, uh, is, is not bad at all. It, I mean, it, for sure, no one has disproven that it happens, and it's, it's a very powerful idea, I think, uh, conditioning. What happened with behaviorism is that they overemphasized it, and they, they tried to make it the go-to the, the go theory for everything. Everything that animals do, everything that humans do, at some point they, they dropped the humans to some degree because the cognitive psychology was coming up and the cognitive psychologists were saying, well, there's a lot more to human behavior than just the conditioning. There's, mm -hmm. there's cognition and intelligence and consciousness involved and, and emotions and so on. And behaviorism didn't, didn't want to talk about these internal states. And so they doubled down on the animals and, and said, well, at least in animals, we're not going to talk about emotions. And consciousness and I think um, they are now on their way out in animal behavior because they they got stuck with with that very narrow idea that they had so it's not a wrong idea but it was they tried to squeeze everything in there and so now we have a lot of studies of emotions in animals uh, cognitive strategies of animals and so the younger generation of people who work on animal behavior they don't follow the behavioristic paradigm so much anymore as they used to. What what do they follow? Well, we we're trying to develop theories about cognition that that okay. are that are not entirely based on uh, conditioning. So, so for a while there was a time when I was a student, for example, where each time you propose something about animals, let's say you say animals can plan for the future, or animals can um, have metacognition, or all all these. Con complex concepts that we developed, uh, people would say, well, I can probably explain that with some sort of conditioning theory. And so that would be always the alternative that we had to fight against. But um, now we have reached a point, I think, that we don't fight so much against that anymore because it has been defeated uh, so many times. And so we don't take that argument so serious anymore. Okay. All right. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm a, this might be a d kind of difficult question to parcel out because your life has been so intertwined with with uh, with um, different species and, and primates. 
But I'm wondering how that has informed your view of, of humans and how you see your fellow humans. Well, I look at humans as primates. So I, I don't see humans as... I mean, yeah, I mean non, non-human primates, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't non-verbal. see humans as uh, separate from the animal kingdom. I, I think we are animals and, and our cognition is animal-like and our emotions are animal-like. So... Um, that has actually not changed. I think I've always looked at humans uh, more or less that way. And I think the more we know about other primates, like chimpanzees and bonobos, the more we see uh, how much we are like apes. We're, we're just very smart. We're smart apes. I think that's the only difference. The, our social emotional setup is very similar. It's in the intelligence and in the language where we see the differences. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, as we wrap up here, if, if assuming when let's let's assume that uh, when you die, you get to you get to you get to reincarnate, okay? Mm-hmm. You get to re-up as as whatever animal species you want. What are you picking? I would probably want to come back as a bird. Bird. Yeah, I love the corvids. You know, the the crows and the ravens and so on. Huh. That's maybe something. Uh, that would be tempting for me. Okay. It, it, it is, of course, an illusion, but we, when we look at birds, we see freedom, basically. Yeah. Because they can move from place to place without much effort. Uh, and so uh, it is maybe an illusion, but I, I think I would want to come back as a smart bird, okay. like a corvette. All right. And I'm wondering, I see a lot of CDs behind you. You're uh, obviously <laughs> either an audio book lover or a music lover, both. What uh-huh. uh, What's the best concert you've ever been to? Concert? Yeah. I don't go often to concerts, uh, except for classical ones. No performance? Yeah, I go to uh, okay. classical ones. So, so the, one of the most popular that we have in the Netherlands is called the Matthias Passion, which is, which is a, a, a Bach pas, a pas, passion, passion, which in, in Holland they always play in March and April. They play them for full churches for everybody. And, and that's always very beautiful. So that, that would be... But pop concerts, if that's what you mean... Uh, last one, I may have seen the Eagles or something. <laughs> okay. Right. That was sort of it. was beautiful. Yeah, no, it was no, great. not just yeah. pop. I mean, uh, the classical counts uh, as yeah. well. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, what book are you taking with you to a desert island? If you can only choose one. Oh. I don't know. At the moment, I'm, I'm into Murakami. So maybe one of those books. Yeah. But I'm What's not that? sure. Uh, at a desert island means you read it and you read it and you yeah. many times I, I'm not sure that that's what my goal is yeah Murakami. yeah okay mm-hmm. um and, uh, I think that there's a lot of a lot of good work being done to to bring evolution to the to the to the pop speaking of pop the popular uh, culture and um I see a lot I see a lot happening there and I think I think people are 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 um are absorbing it it's, i think it's a it's a it's a buzzword right now yeah it's interesting that the younger generation um uh, accepts it much more and so the acceptance of evolution is is increasing in this country uh, that has always disturbed me is that at the schools they would sometimes not teach it or teach it mm-hmm. very poorly mm-hmm. uh, i believe that's changing so so that's my optimistic view now is that it's maybe changing yeah well i hope so i hope so uh, well, well, thank you so much for um, being so generous to, to share of your 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 wisdom and experience with with us here at uh, the podcast. And um, um, if you are interested in in uh, reading more or learning more about Franz Franz's work, you can go to uh, his website. You can search his name, and you'll see the, the Living Links website. Uh, he has several books online, and. Uh, and uh, also a Facebook, active Facebook page, um, yeah. that uh, that I recommend checking out. And uh, and if, if if you're if you're also interested in in um, this, some of this topic of evolution, especially as it pertains to health, health, uh, please check out my my uh, podcast, Honorable Evolution, where I talk to folks who are really wa- uh, talk, walking the talk and uh, and uh, and living in a, in an honorable way to themselves and and the, the greater community. So, um, Franz. Thank you. You're welcome. It was great. Thanks. But I'm getting stronger. They take a piece of me. 